The underlying motivation to engage in physical activity is a complex dynamic and one that is difficult to navigate for many people. Of particular concern are adolescent girls who are less likely to engage in and enjoy physical activity compared to adolescent boys. Programs that tackle this gap and create opportunities to instill confidence in young girls to be active must be a priority for public health. In this episode, we'll be talking about a unique program that aims to positively influence the physical and psychosocial health of middle school girls. Let's talk about Smart Fit Girls. This is the Public Health Insight Podcast. My name is Linda, your host for this episode, and I'm here with co-hosts Gordon, LaShawn, and two special guests who will be introduced in a moment. Before we move on, it is important to note that the views expressed in this podcast are our own and do not represent any of the organizations we work for or are affiliated with. Dr. Chrissy Chard is the co-founder of a nonprofit organization for middle school students called Smart Fit Girls. Chrissy is also an assistant professor in the Department of Health and Exercise Science at Colorado State University and the Department of Community and Behavioral Health with the Colorado School of Public Health. She teaches courses including social and community factors in health, physical activity in public health, and health promotion programming. Dr. Chard's research focuses on physical activity, self-esteem, and body image in adolescent girls, as well as tailoring programs using community-based participatory research. She has a strong interest in examining the ways that racism, structural bias, and social inequities further the health disparities that continue to persist. She deeply values her close community of friends and family, including her partner and three children, and she loves moving her body in ways that feel good, which usually means lifting weights. Ellie Jenkins is a junior high school student in Commerce City, Colorado. Ellie enjoys playing sports, especially cheerleading, basketball, and volleyball. She also enjoys spending her time dancing and acting. Ellie values her family and has a special relationship with her dad and younger sister. She's excited about going to college in the coming years, where she plans to major in psychology, as she has a strong interest in better understanding the capacity of the brain. Ellie believes strongly in the potential of the human mind and hopes to further that understanding in the future. She also participated in the Smart Fit Girls program for about three years. We're excited to welcome both Chrissy and Ellie to the Public Health Insight Podcast. Thanks for joining us to discuss some exciting work that you're both involved with. Welcome. Thank you and welcome. Thank you. Thanks for having us. No problem. Okay, so first of all, Chrissy and Ellie, how did the two of you meet? It's more of like a, a social network, you know, like friend of a friend. Because um, my mom knew um, a lady that uh, Chrissy was working with um, named Miss Deborah Ford. And so she knew Deb and Deb knew Chrissy. And Chrissy was telling Deb about this um, program that she had. And of course, Deb is like, oh, that sounds really great. So then she tells my mom and my mom's like, oh, that's really great. So she like just picks me up and was like, go, you're going into this. <laughs> and so that's kind of that's that's basically the story of how Chrissy and I met. And we we're like, and we're, we're still friends. She keeps in contact with me. She keeps in touch with um, my family. We're always talking about school. We're always texting about things and I don't know yeah it's just it's just different I was, I've never like had that close of a friend that kind of came out of like basically nowhere you know <laughs> like I've I've gone to her house I've met her kids I've um, <laughs> you know like her kids and I are basically best friends like I've mm. met her husband her husband and I are best friends like so that's that's the story of how Chrissy and I met <laughs> awesome anything to add to that Chrissy uh, I don't think so. You know, I think it started off, like Ellie mentioned, in a Smart Fit Girls setting. And then, you know, and part of what I think we'll talk about at some point today is the importance of relationship when working really with anybody, but especially, you know, if you're working with young people and you want them really involved in something, it's about building that relationship outside of the time that you spend just at Smart Fit Girls in this case or, or with the programming. Interesting. So, you know, Ellie, it seems like you're very interested in psychology. Um, did this have anything to do with your experience with SmartFit Girls? Oh, yeah. Um, I think that SmartFit um, 
kind of, because before then, I didn't really know what I wanted to do. You know, people would ask me, like, oh, what do you want to do when you grow up? And I was kind of like, I don't know. I'll just kind of do whatever, you know, whatever. Mm-hmm. Just see where it goes. But I think after Smart Fit Girls and after, like, um, those different discussion groups, like, the things that the girls were saying, I was like, wow. Like, this is very, like, psychological type stuff mm. and the experiences that they were sharing. And so then the more I thought about it, the more I was like... We don't really explore that side of the brain. We kind of don't give our brain enough credit almost. We kind of just see it as like it does the basic things like, you know, telling us when we need to move our hand off of a hot stove or telling us when we need to go drink water or something. But I don't think we give it credit for the like psychological things that it can do. And I think if people understood that more, we'd understand more of like, you know, the reasons behind mental illnesses, how to help with mental illnesses, um, you know, how to help with anxiety and depression. Mm -hmm. But I think we're so stuck on just, you know, the simple things and the basic things that our brain can do. We don't necessarily look that far into that. And I think especially people of color get overlooked with that side of the brain too. So I think if, if I go into that study and I go into that field, I can almost be like an ambassador mm. and just kind of like show the rest of the world and help give that insight to the rest of the world. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> I'm excited for the field of psychology when you yeah. enter it. <laughs> I'm excited for her to join as a regular co-host at this point. We would be very interested in knowing like what you end up doing because that sounds yeah. fantastic. Fantastic. And this is an invitation ahead of time. You're welcome on the podcast. Yes. Chrissy, we had the pleasure of meeting you last year, uh, LaShawn, Gordon, myself. And, you know, it was immediately obvious to us. It was apparent that you were passionate about equity issues, about public health issues. So I'm curious to learn how you were able to also incorporate your passions with health and exercise with your um, equity and social justice passions as well. Mm, yeah, it's such a great question. You know, there are a lot of forms of oppression. And I think even in public health lately, right, you've seen in, in the U.S., we've seen counties and states name racism as a public health issue, right? There are, we're starting uh, to name this. There's this other form of oppression, youth oppression, that I don't think is a part of the conversation as much as it really needs to be. Right. And youth oppression being the ways that we oppress young people solely because of their age. And that to me is a really important piece of Smart Fit Girls. It's an important value of our organization is to be interrogating the own ways that our organization is unintentionally oppressing young people. And so mm-hmm. that's been an important piece for our, our organization to think about how do we engage young people in all stages of the process, you know, and I think we're still learning, right? Our youth advisory board is fairly new. I think it's been over the last two years. And so there, but there are these pieces of oppression that have to do with young people. And the other way to think about it is adultism, right? And it's Mm -hmm. the ways that we might discredit youth, right? We'll say things like, oh, their brains aren't developed enough. Or, you know, I, I have a niece and all she cares about is her cell phone, right? discredit. It can also show up as this sort of setting setting young people up for failure, right? Like, well, I tried to engage with them, but last time nobody showed up mm-hmm. without reflecting on the ways that we perhaps didn't set them up to be successful in whatever that setting is. Um, it also shows up as like this sort of decorative or performative, like, you know, let's have them, let's have young people help with a, a food drive or a coat drive without really thinking about decision making, shared power. Um, And so I think organizations that work with young people in any capacity have a real opportunity to, again, interrogate the ways that we aren't centering the voices of young people. We aren't yet sharing power, shared decision making, some of the things that are really critical to push back against adultism and youth oppression. That's powerful. Interesting. So, So you're almost saying adults or older adults having that mindset could be doing more damage than we realize. Yeah, yes. And could be creating programs that not only are not effective or not as effective Mm. as they could be, but could be harmful, right? Mm. We have a responsibility in public health to be stewards of our resources. And so if we're in a situation where we're wasting resources, 
we aren't being as effective as we could be. To me, that's a public health ethical issue that, you know, again, that we need to think really hard about. Mm-hmm. And just when you're saying that, it made me think of how, you know, as young people and as adolescents, that's such a key developmental age and um, harm done at that type at that time of development can have lasting impact. So um, I think that your passion to engage in disrupting those power dynamics is important. And I'm um, excited for us to chat more about how you do that specifically with Smart Fit Girls. So um, can you please tell us a little more what exactly is Smart Fit Girls? Sure, yes. So Smart Fit Girls is a program that's really centered around supporting um, adolescent girls. It's really focused on middle school, um, supporting girls to step into their internal and external strength. Um, it's meant, it's sort of two parts. There's the physical activity piece and our physical activity piece is really focused on strength training. And that's been intentional for multiple reasons. One, adolescence is a really critical time to build bone health and to maintain bone, right? And so there used to be this idea that, oh, you're going to stunt growth if you lift when when people are young, right? That has all been very much um, debunked. And in fact, it's swung the other way to say, no, in fact, this is the ideal time to engage in strength training. It's also good for um, prevention of diabetes, vascular health. There's a lot of benefits. It also is a very empowering form of physical activity. It's not about shrinking our bodies or getting smaller or trying to lose weight, right? In fact, it's about stepping into your own strength and that then can translate to other aspects of your life. When you feel physically Mm -hmm. strong, right? And research shows that, that impacts your self-esteem and your confidence in other areas of your life. So there's the physical activity piece and then there's the curriculum. And that's where we delve into topics around body image, self-esteem, bullying, self-love, positive affirmations, um, all kinds of other topics that are the things that um, young women and young people in general, I would say, are really grappling with at that age. So it started as an after-school program. We now run it as a summer camp. We've done some virtual programming now because of um, COVID. And we also partner with some school districts where they'll offer it as either an elective course or as a PE alternative um, to the so girls could sign up to take smart girls instead of traditional PE. So it's a lot of different ways, but at its core and its essence, is the physical activity piece, the self-esteem body image piece, and then this other really critical component around a sense of belonging and the camaraderie that young women in the group feel with one another, the connection and whatnot. That's a very interesting concept. I remember going through, um, and we know we, we in our previous conversations it did come up, but I've never really did a deep dive into the rationale behind the program and you know some of the outcomes. And I, we were all enlightened when we read those papers so like we can't wait to hear more about it Mm -hmm. and i think ellie as someone who uh, participated in the program um what did a what was a typical day like in in terms of participating in the program um yeah so we usually like you'd come in um it was more towards like um the afternoon um because we mainly ran it during like the summer and Mm. you know you wanted to give people I mean, it's, it's summer, so, you know, you're going to have kids who don't wake up until, like, 11, 12 o'clock. So in order to, so to have a program running when someone just wakes up is probably not the most efficient. Mm. Um, so they'd usually be in the afternoon, like, you know, two or three. And so you'd go in and there'd be, um, there wouldn't really be, like, an agenda per se. There would just be um, kind of things that we'd want to hit and then there would just be like okay so how are we going to hit these different things rather than walking in and being like we're going to do this 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 and this and this time and this time and this is just how it's going to go there was that aspect of like creativity and letting us get to our destination our way per se um there was always uh healthy snacks we definitely did promote um the healthier snack options so it'd be fruits veggies um, stuff like that. Um, usually, also coming from um, 
like a farm rather than like processed veggies you know rather than just going to the store and getting like the packaged veggies or the packaged fruits they come from um a farm which interestingly enough was also like independently grown uh by like black women right Mm -hmm. so that also tied into what we were doing and then there would always be some fitness aspect um so you know we do like a a fitness cycle with like 20 jumping jacks and like 15 sit-ups you know something like that but something fitness wise to um, make sure that the session was hitting both points of our program like because you mentioned it is a physical and then also um a body image and like a mental aspect so we'd have those talks and we'd have those group discussions but then there would also be making sure that there was that physical side Mm -hmm. and that that piece you mentioned about not having it I like the break of dawn that was particularly <laughs> interesting because it ties back into chrissy's point on um this is how it was when i was growing up and i want to impose that in order for you to be a functioning member of society you got to be up at six in the morning and start exercising at seven but what you're saying is like no there's a recognition that you know youth or especially in the summer maybe going to bed later waking up later and then having the program at a time where people can actually Uh, be involved in it so I think that was a very Mm -hmm. interesting point that you mentioned Mm -hmm. and I guess another thing to add is um, this this program sounds fantastic and reading the paper um, I was telling Linda and Gordon earlier my my jaw my jaw dropped it was just such a you know such an intentional program are there other programs that look at both these aspects of the physical and the psychosocial aspects? Like I know everyone has probably heard of different fitness programs aimed at different population, different target groups, but that social, the psychosocial aspect seems very, very interesting and unique. Yeah, there's one other um, organization who I always like to lift up. Um, you know, there are so few of us in this space that anytime I have a chance to acknowledge others that are out there that are doing really important work called Girls on the Run. And I don't know if you all have that in Canada. Um, it's it's like national. It's across the U.S. and they have done a really exceptional job. I think we've you know learned from watching their organization. The primary difference is their focus is on running. Um, so, but they also have that really intentional sort of psychosocial piece to their curriculum. So they're the other really big player in the space. Who again, I I think we look to as an example of how you grow something and be really intentional with it. Just to follow up with that, it's intriguing to me that that focus on weightlifting, which I don't hear often, especially in this um, age group, like middle school. How how did that come into kind of the forefront of this program as a area to focus on specifically? Yeah, I'll be perfectly honest. It was a self, uh, it was from personal experience. And, you know, without going into too much detail, as when I was in college and graduate school, Um, I was struggling with some disordered eating and really struggling with body image stuff myself. And I, by happenstance, got into weightlifting. Um, I ended up competitively powerlifting for a few years. But what I saw in that shift for me around not what your body looks like, but what your body can do was a profound shift for me. And I think you can still replicate that with running. I absolutely do. At the same time, there are people, girls, for whom running isn't comfortable. They don't feel like they're good at it. It doesn't feel accessible. Um, whereas some some of those girls who might not feel connected to running are really strong, right? And you can start spring training as, you know, with body weight stuff and build up to there. And so it really was not a selfish, but it was from personal experience to see just how profoundly impactful this ability to step into your own strength and see what your body can do when it's strong that we then um, uh, created the that piece of the Smart Fit Girls. Program. Yeah. And I think, too, one of the things mentioned in the paper is that weightlifting had that stereotype of being you know a type of exercise that men would typically do and then to have um women and girls being empowered to like there's no reason that this particular exercise is out of reach for you is a empowering thing in of itself and i think that was one of the key things i noticed too 
When we look at physical activity, it's so tied to our body image and self-esteem. And I think as women, we're often told, you know, you exercise because you want to achieve a certain figure, a certain shape. And if you're lifting weights, you might become too like masculine and mm. things like that. But um, Chrissy, you had highlighted how Smart Fit Girls is more from a strength based perspective, not a deficit, like you're not exercising because you need to lose weight or you need to change your how your body looks, but rather to um, see what your body can do. And mm-hmm. I think that's definitely a message I, I needed when I was in adolescence and even now because physical activity was not something I enjoyed. So, mm-hmm. yeah. And it's such a, you know, I, I want to just name right now, one of the values of our organization that's so important to us is that we are not about weight loss. We ha- mm-hmm. Our programming, what we do, what we teach has nothing to do with your body weight. Mm-hmm. Um, and we can have a whole other podcast episode on this notion of, I'll put obesity in quotes, right? And the mm-hmm. ways, and the harmful ways that we think about obesity, right? And that we don't talk about weight stigma and weight discrimination mm-hmm. nearly enough. Um, mm-hmm. And so, yes, Linda, you know, what you're saying is so important that it's about what our bodies can do not what they look like. And that, you know, LaShawn, back to your point of the paper, that was one of the real themes that came out as we were doing focus groups with participants when we were trying to understand what about our program was resulting in girls feeling better about their bodies. That was a key theme was this idea of body utility, right? Right. That it shifted the way I viewed my body, that it's not about what it looks like that it's about what it it can do right and the functions and not even necessarily like when you're an all-star athlete right but that your body your legs for many people allow you to walk right and your your arms allow you to hug the people that you love right they're just your body does so many amazing beautiful things that we don't focus on often Tying into that, when we look at body image and self-esteem, you know, there was a study in the U.S. that found girls' self-esteem drops significantly from ages of 12 to 17. So this is that prime adolescence period. And when we look at how physical activity can often perpetuate these negative um, ideas of how your body should look, I think having something like smart fit girls is important to counter that and to help shift that downward trend of self-esteem that we see in adolescent girls. We have to under, understand the underlying motivation behind physical activity. And um, we'll get to it with the Melanin Magic specific um, um, program. But those underlying reasons might be different. Even within young adolescent girls, there are still disparities even within that um, demographic that um, programs like Melon and Magic seek to address. Yeah, and, and I guess just to add to this discussion, so with with this kind of critical period that Linda has mentioned in terms of the body image, um, you know, 12 to 17 range, what what exactly is the difference in, between body image and self-esteem? Yeah, I'll, I'm happy to start. And then Ellie, if you want to add anything about sort of your personal experience, um, I think that would be helpful. The way we think about the difference is um, self-esteem is sort of this global how you feel about yourself broadly and it can it can entail body image as a, a component of it but it's also how you feel about your intelligence your social right your whole self versus body image is very much about your physical self and how you feel about your physical self and then that also to be clear, I think sometimes we narrowly think about body image to say like, you know, the shape of your body, right? But that can be skin color, that can be ability status, right? It, um, it can be wrapped up in gender and your identity and your gender expression, right? So there's a lot when, it, when we talk about body image, it's much more expansive than just the shape of my body. Yeah, and kind of to add to Chrissy's point, I kind of like to think of it as like self Self-esteem is how you feel on the inside, whereas body image and body positivity is more of the outside, you know, because self-esteem can be multiple things. It can range from your body to the way you talk, to the way you act, to the way you sound to other people. Like, that is self-esteem, and that's all internal. And body positivity, it's also, um, to Chrissy's point again, self-esteem is, is broad, and body positivity is more specific. It's more the way your body looks, the way... Um, it does or doesn't have the things that are supposed to, you know, fit society's norms. 
And I think that that, for me, is probably the biggest difference between self-esteem and body positivity because you can, you can like the way your body looks and not have self-esteem on the inside. But I don't think you can have, I don't think it could be the other way around. You can't have self-esteem on the inside and not like the way your body looks, right? So I think that it has to be that internal thing first before you are trying to fix what's external. Mm-hmm. That's, That's a, a great point. distinction. So I guess since you're, you've participated um, in those, I think you said it was three years, um, about three years you were involved. Did you notice any changes along any of those lines? Do you find yourself being a little bit more confident, uh, motivated to, to do more physical activity, your self-esteem? Did you notice any of that change? Oh, yeah, most definitely. Um, especially, and I think, because, I don't know, the Melanin Magic program is like my favorite to talk <laughs> about. But especially during the Melanin Magic program, because it's it's hard to realize that there are people that are in the same boat as you Mm. until you hear someone say that right Mm. like you don't necessarily realize that there are other people who are struggling with your same body image you know there are other people struggling with the way they look you don't realize that there are other people like me who are struggling with this until you hear someone come out and actually say like hey i'm struggling with this too and then on top of that again to chrissy's point you start building relationships and that kind of um took me on this like path to getting involved in um more sports you know so it used to just be kind of the basic things um but now i'm doing cheerleading and volleyball and basketball and i'm going out and running every day that i can i can't do it as much anymore because I'm back at school, but every day that I can, I'm going out and I'm running. I'm going out and I'm, you know, shooting hoops. I'm going out and I'm tossing a volleyball up to myself. Uh, on the days where it's colder or it gets too late, I'm inside practicing stunts. I'm inside, you know, um, flipping around. I'm inside running up and down the stairs. And I think that without that Melanin Magic program, without hearing that there are other shared experiences, I don't think I would have had such a there wouldn't have been such a fuel there would not have been such a drive to try to do something different if i had not been part of that program amen dr jenkins <laughs> 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 ali you keep mentioning how much you love melanin magic so let's talk about melanin magic what is melanin magic oh yes 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 okay <laughs> so melanin magic is a program that um I'm actually not sure if it was, I don't think it was started before I got there. I think it was actually started um, after I got there. Um, And again, I was only there for three years, but to my knowledge, I don't think SmartFit, SmartFit was kind of just, you know, it was for girls. Like, obviously the name is in the title, SmartFit Girls, but Melanin Magic was kind of a piece of that SmartFit Girls that we were tailoring, especially towards um, adolescent uh, girls of color and and African-American girls. And... The program that we had when I was there, um, there were definitely more high schoolers. Um, but I think I think it's just because the middle schoolers were just slightly intimidated, and they were like, "I don't, I don't really know if I want to do that." Um, but that Melanin Magic program, it was so, it was so invigorating, and it was so powerful and so helpful because African American women in general, but especially like those of us who were in middle school, in high school, in college, we already get excluded from everything we already Mm. feel this sense of exclusion like nobody really wants us here like what are we even doing and that melanin magic program was kind of smart fit's way of saying like hey we do want you here we do want you to be a part of this and i think that's why we had the number of girls show up that we did because they also felt that sense of inclusion that sense of like hey we actually do want to hear your voice like you don't have to feel as though nobody wants to hear you anymore and i was just talking to chrissy about this um last night that it was that sense of humility instead of getting up and um talking and just ex um just acting as though you know everything especially coming from that um that and i don't want to get all like racial and historical but that that race go for it get racial that, and historical yeah. right? <laughs> that type that you know you're coming from a race who is who's always had the privilege mm-hmm. right and so with that privilege you don't you don't really listen 
it's mm. it's kind of a it's kind of a roadblock because you come up and you think that you know everything and so then um, you're trying to talk about things that you don't necessarily understand experiences that you never really lived and so as a black person hearing that it's kind of like well, what are you what are you talking about you have no idea how that works so that sense of humility where Chrissy came in and was like I this is new to me. This is not my neck of the woods. I'm not going to sit up here and pretend like I know what's going on. I'm not going to try to act as though I've lived in your shoes. I'm just going to sit back and let you guys do the talking. And I think it was that change from going, especially uh, being for myself, being in predominantly like white schools mm. where it's just, you know, it's, it's all of that. No one wants to really listen to you. Mm. And then on top of that, they try to like, tell you how to live your experience mm -hmm. and so it was that that humility change for Chrissy to come in and be like I have no idea what's going on but I would like to learn mm -hmm. you know that aspect of seeking to understand rather than seeking to be understood and validating your experience too like this is real because it happens to you even if maybe Chrissy didn't experience it it doesn't right. mean that it doesn't exist exactly mm-hmm yeah, I think there's this important piece around privilege that I find sometimes gets missed from the conversation. That privilege, certainly how we characterize it, right? This unearned benefits and whatnot. But privilege also, I think, can be characterized as a lack, right? A deficit in understanding, in skills, right? It necessarily means you've got blind spots, right? Of mm. course I do because not my lived experience. And so I think that's an important piece to remember for anybody, right? This is community engagement generally, right? When you're engaging with folks who you don't share lived experiences with, you have to recognize that you don't know everything there is to know. And I think there's, again, you know, in academia, right? And we come in and we think we have all these ideas, right? And the knowledge that we want to deliver, all of this sort of deficit mindset and this deficit approach that we take back to the beginning of our conversation can be so harmful and so counterproductive. And so, you know, I think for me that one of the most important aspects is exactly what Ellie mentioned, this notion of humility to say, gosh, I don't know everything there is to know. And in fact, there's a lot I don't know. And what an opportunity I have to learn um, and be present in this space and, and how gracious for Ellie and the other young women in that program, right, to allow me to be in that space, um, to learn, to grow, to connect, to build relationships, all of the things that we talk about when it comes to how do you engage with one another. Um, yeah, yeah, really, I think, showed up in the Melanin Ma Magic Project. And to Chrissy's, like, earlier point of adultism, I think also helped with that relationship, you know, because this generation here is a lot of, like, oh, well, I know more because, you know, I've lived longer. And to me, that sentence doesn't really hold a lot of water <laughs> because I'm like, okay, but you know more about when you were a kid from your time. Like, if you think, like, if any of your parents have said, like, back when my day or when I was a kid, like, why do all of those sentences start with Ugh. those transitional <laughs> words? Because there, there was clearly a difference in the time periods that when we were children and when they were children. And, like, the... Um, the metaphor I like to use is like, okay, if you take a caveman and you put him in like modern 21st century, <laughs> who is going to know more about the modern 21st century? The caveman that has lived forever and ever and ever, or the actual modern, for the 21st century guy who, you know, knows what a car is and knows how to drive one and knows what electricity is. Who's going to know more? Certainly not the caveman because he's never seen any of that before, mm -hmm. right? And so as, and I think it's so powerful that Chrissy was a white adult who came in with humility from both of those places and was like I don't know what it's like to be a kid in this 21st century I don't know what it's like to be a black female kid in this 21st century and the amount that those girls opened up when they realized like that hey she's actually on our side like it was it was crazy to see the kinds of stuff that they were sharing with someone that they kind of like just met but it was because Chrissy came in with that sense of humility and I know personally if she had not come in with that we would not be in this relationship that we are today I probably would not have even continued going to smart fit 
So I think that is probably one of the biggest pieces of Melody Magic and Smart Fit as a whole. I am like, what do you, how do you even respond to that? that I need that, to absorb that, it. <laughs> that, that, that analogy that you made is better than any analogy I've made in the 60 episodes. I've done. So we're definitely going to use that as a sound bite. You've just heard part one of Gordon, LaShawn, and Linda's conversation with Chrissy and Ellie about Smart Fit Girls, a unique program that aims to positively influence the physical and psychosocial health of middle school girls. Tune into the next episode for the second half of the discussion, where they discuss the importance of co-creating youth programming with the very youth the programs are intended to serve and the need to constantly explore ways to enhance inclusivity. Thank you for listening to the Public Health Insight Podcast, your go-to space for informative conversations, inspiring community action. If you enjoy our content and would like to stay up to date, follow us on Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, and LinkedIn. To learn more about our community initiatives and how you can support us, visit our website at thepublichealthinsight.com. Join the PHI community and let's make public health viral. Public Health Insight.